We're taking stock two days to the Democracy Day celebration that's on May the 29th. We're looking at the economy two years after. We're looking at major policies. We're looking at major achievements and perhaps uh, one or two other areas that uh, policymakers can do more. Uh, being joined now in the studio by the Director General of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and the Industry, Muda Yusuf. Thank you so much, Muda, for being here. Thank you very much. Well, here we are, two years after. Yeah. And I must say, uh, perhaps you would also agree with me, it, you know, it's been a little bit turbulent. And, you know, managing uh, an economic ship, as I called it, such as the Nigerian economy, yeah. it, you know, it, it can be easy. And I know that it hasn't been easy for our economic managers, the managers of the economy. We've yeah. come in from, we're coming from a place where macroeconomic indices were very, very unstable. There was so much you know, volatility, a lot of you know, system embedded in so much corruption. But it looks like in the last two years, you know, so many things have been achieved. But let, let's start with macroeconomic indices. As we were talking before we came on, uh, the, the finance minister did say that before the economic team took over, you know, the last time we saw macroeconomic indices positive, as it were, that was early 1990s. Mm. But she said in the last two years, they've been able to put them, all of them, at least a major four of them, into positive territory. Yes, uh, the present administration has done a lot in the area of uh, improving on the macroeconomic fundamentals. And uh, <clears throat> looking at the economy generally, I think that is one area where we can at least give a pass mark. Although, uh, to the man on the street, uh, macroeconomic data or macroeconomic fundamentals may not mean much. And that is where <coughs> we have an issue with the way we rate the performance of the economy. Uh, but looking at the macroeconomic fundamentals, and let, before we even go to that, to analyze the economy fairly holistically, we could look at three key dimensions. There is the macroeconomic dimension, which looks at all these macroeconomic indicators, GDP growth, exchange rate, the debt uh, situation, inflation, and so on. Then we also will look at the business environment. Because the economy is not just about data, it's also about the conditions in which businesses operate. How has the business environment fared in the last three years? So that is also very critical. And here we'll be looking at the issues of infrastructure, issues of credit, the institutions, and so on. And all the ratings. Because over time we have had ratings of a global comp competitiveness index. We have had ratings with, with regard to the doing business report of the World Bank, you know, and, and so on and so forth. Then, more importantly, we have to look at the welfare impact of government policies. Because to the man on the street, what matters is the extent to which economic management or government policies have been able to put bread on the table, have been able to put food on the table, have been able to create jobs, have been able to improve the standard of living. That is what makes sense to the man on the street, and that's what counts, you know. So that, th these are the dimensions I would like us to, to, to look at. And now talking about the macroeconomic uh, indicators, we start with the GDP, GDP growth. Uh, GDP growth performance has been quite impressive in relative terms. Because over the past few years, because of all the challenges we have in Europe, in America, and things mm -hmm. like that, uh, GDP growth performance has been, real, has been quite low. But when you compare what we have with what is happening in the global economy generally, uh, of course, we will reach Nigerian performance as very good. Uh, in 2009, for instance, we had a 6.9% GDP growth. In 2010, we had 7.85% GDP growth. In 2011, we had 7.45%. And in 2012, we had 6.61%. You know, and whereas if you look at what is happening in Europe, Asia, and so on, what you have is uh, generally you have less than 5%. In Europe, you have even close to 2%. In some mm -hmm. economies, you have even negative growth. So in terms of growth performance, I think it, it has been good. But again, people worry about the quality of growth. You know, when you say the economy is growing, and that is the question that recurs all the time. 
the citizens say we are not seeing the growth. Because, take it or leave it, the economy is still structurally deficient. Structurally deficient because it is still heavily dependent on oil. And that makes the economy very, very vulnerable. And that is one of the major risks that we still face in this economy. About 80% or slightly above that of the revenue is from oil. Over 90% of the foreign exchange is also from oil. So if anything happens, as it may, because given all the scenarios we are seeing now with regard to supply and demand side of the oil market, it is, there is a real possibility that there could be sharp declines in these prices. And if that happens, the shock on the economy will be very profound. So that is the challenge we face with regard to the structure. Then going to uh, some other indicators, look at external reserves. In 2010, the external reserves was 32.2 billion US dollars. In 2011, 32.65 billion US dollars. In 2012, 43.2 eight five billion dollars and in May twenty thirteen we have forty eight point four eight billion US dollars. That's a fairly comfortable uh, reserves. But the beauty of having a robust reserve is that it helps to be able to stabilize your exchange rate. It also helps to inspire confidence of investors. Because when you do international trades, you must be able to settle transactions with international currency. And the kind of reserves you have is what will give the signal to your uh, partners, you know, international uh, partners in business, that, okay, this economy is a stable economy. No, so well, with this well, kind well, of... Why do you think the monetary authorities were able to achieve this? Because I know we're coming from a place where, you know, external reserves were, you know, quite low, as, as you just reeled out. Yeah. What, what, what uh, was it a certain environment or just policies of the monetary authorities? Well, that well there are, the it's, it's a combination time. of quite a number of factors. First, the performance of oil prices have been generally good, so that creates some room for savings. Then we also had the monetary policy tightening, that is one of the positive outcomes of monetary policy tightening, uh, because as you know, the core mandate of the CBN is monetary stability, inflation exchange rate stability. And the policy of the CBN in the last two years have been to tighten monetary policy. And that has also had an effect in stabilizing uh, uh, prices and also beefing up the, the foreign reserves. Then we also have had significant inflow of portfolio investments. Because the economy is a high interest rate economy. Okay, can we say that that's perhaps because I've heard many analysts mm -hmm. say that, that they believe that that's perhaps even the key factor why we had more of this, you know, inflow coming in because, you know, the high interest rate environment and they got a signal that this present uh, uh, monetary policy committee uh, seemed to be more inclined to keeping these rates high. So yeah. they you know, made more of them come and the ones that were here made them even stay, you know, even longer. So yeah. more yeah. of those funds. No, th th that is true because uh, all over the world you hardly can find an economy where you can make the kind of money you make in Nigeria through portfolio investments. Quite a number of them have come to the money market. Quite a number have bought into treasury based federal government bonds, and they, they are really making, they are really having a good time because of the high interest rates. That and outside the country, interest rates two percent, three percent. In some economies, they are even talking of zero percent. So you can imagine what you make moving funds from such economies to uh, an economy like the, the Nigerian economy. You know, where at the time even federal government bonds was uh, going for close to 15% or more. Treasury base was also going to 12-14%. So a lot of such funds came in. But the worry about that is that it created a situation where quite a number of investors were making money without creating value. You know, and uh, that does not really benefit the economy as such. Because the beauty of uh, an investor that makes money from the point of view of 
the economy itself is that there has to be some value creation. But that, that we, we can't classify that as real FDI. No, it's not real FDI. It's yes, not so, real. But so, so the question of adding value as it were. Yeah, but it's still a force into the economy. I mean, what, what, then what is the benefit for Nigerians and for the economy? If investors just fly in here, take advantage of what is on ground, and fly out. But it boosts the so reserves, it, it, and we're able to... Well, that gives us better ratings, doesn't it? And have uh, extend our reserves. imports. Uh, never, I mean, it, it, it boosts reserves, okay. but it, it could also create an illusion. You know? It could create an illusion of comfort. Because if anything snaps, these phones will exit. We have seen that in the past. And if you are not careful, it could lead to a hole that could further destabilize the entire economy. So there is a limit to which we can begin to celebrate such inflows. And it is important. Within the framework of the entire concept about foreign investment, foreign direct investment, portfolio investment, these things have to be structured in a way that they will create value for the economy. Because the whole essence of economic management is to make sure that whatever transactions are taking place benefit the economy, not just the business person, not just the investor, whether local or, or, or foreign. It has to be structured, there has to be a framework that makes sure that there is benefit for the economy. Now, so so, so, so that, that, is the, that, that is the issue about... about uh, the, that, that's a particular about, about type that, of uh, yes. inflow. We're still speaking about FDI, foreign direct investment. I spoke to the Minister of Trade and Investment last week, and you know, he was very, you know, very proud about the fact, you know, all that uh, the ministry said it has achieved in the last uh, two years, bringing in more foreign uh, direct investment, more foreign, uh, going on, you know, many uh, tours, uh, talking to many investors whom he said have shown a lot of interest. And Nigeria now is the number one destination, uh, FDI destination on the continent, overtaking South Africa. For you, when you hear things like that, what comes to your mind? Well, it doesn't excite me much. It doesn't excite me much because in other economies, there are policies and structures in place to make sure that when you have FDIs, there is a room for the citizens to benefit. If you go to a place like Qatar, like uh, UAE, for instance, and so on, you can't just fly in as, as a foreign investor and start setting up. They will give you guidelines. Guidelines with regard to the indigents or the citizens that you have to employ. Guidelines with regard to the position that the citizens must fill. Guidelines with regard to how you can develop local capacity. That has to be part of the total package. I mean, look at how long it took us to come up with a local content in the oil and gas sector. After almost over 50 years of that sector being in existence. It's only recently that we came up with the idea that we realized that we need to make the sector a, a bit more inclusive. Because one of the challenges we have today is that most of the sectors that are performing, like telecoms, the level of national or local involvement is still very low. It's still very low in virtually all aspects of that sector. The same thing is happening in, in, in oil and gas. The same thing is even about to happen now, even with regard to the power sector. So if you have a situation where, okay, funds are coming in, there is foreign direct investment, and there is no deliberate policy to ensure inclusion of the locals, of, 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 of domestic entrepreneurs or the, or the indigenous in that process, they will not get much value for it. But you did say that but a number that of steps are taken to protect local good. investors to encourage them because obviously if local investors don't invest, uh, you know, it may be difficult for the foreign investors to come in themselves. No, the thing is that, you see, with the kind of cost environment you have, with the kind of the structure of funds that you have in the financial system, there is no way the local investor can compete with a foreign investor. You can't be taking funds at 20% and you want to compete with somebody who is coming with 3% fund. So from the start, you are already disadvantaged. So unless there is a deliberate policy that, okay, you are coming as a foreign investor, these are the guidelines and these are the benefits that you should deliver 
So that's something you would have so liked the Ministry of Trade and Investment it is, to look at in the last It is very important because in all of these things we have to also be nationalistic. You know, that's what we call economic nationalism. Without prejudice to, you know, liberalizing the economy, but you have to shape things in such a way that you create room, space within the framework of all these inflows for the citizens.